My next guest is Pastor Boyan Jancic, lead pastor of City Life Church right here in New York City. God has done a miracle in his life. Would you welcome with me Pastor Boyan? Woo! Great to see you. It's so good to be in an environment where everyone yeah. celebrates Jesus Christ and celebrates right. what God's done in our lives. And God's done some amazing things in your life, Pastor. Uh, you have a miracle testimony of how you got saved. And you were raised an atheist. Tell us a little bit about your, your, your experience of coming to Jesus. Yeah, I was born in Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And my parents and I immigrated to New York City when I was five years old. So... Technically, I was Eastern Orthodox or okay. Christian Orthodox, but like many people from that region, that meant nothing. We right. were genuinely either atheist or agnostic, and I was raised with no concept of God, never went to church, and around the time when I was 16 years old, because of the hunger that the Lord put inside of me, yeah. you know, I can't boast about trying to find God. He wasn't lost, I was. Right on. Uh -huh. And Jesus said that no one can come to the Father except the Holy Spirit draw them. Yeah. And I started feeling this drawing coupled with a mini crisis that my family and I were going through. Just having immigrated to the United States, feeling the pressure, feeling the, that crushing effect of being new to a country. And it was not easy. And a friend of mine invited me to a church. I am a New Yorker. And so a friend of mine invited me to church in, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. And, so, <laughs> and for our international audience, uh, Brooklyn was a little different 20 years ago. This is not the soy latte sipping, yoga practicing Brooklyn of today. This was uh, the real BK yeah. back in 92. And so I was invited to this church. It was a, uh, a full gospel apostolic church. And so it was a, still is going strong there in the corner of Marcy and Fulton. <laughs> and I'm 16 years old, this white kid from the suburbs of Queens. And I come into this thousand member church that just looked like the whole place was on fire. And uh, the pastor was an aha pastor. <laughs> And so I thought I had just uh, landed in the middle of a circus. Uh, <laughs> towards the end of the service, one of the brothers in the church came up to me and took my hand, went to shake it, and did one of these. <laughs> and he held on to it for an uncomfortably long length of time. Yeah. And he said, brother, brother, brother. <laughs> Can I speak to you outside, please? And he took me across to Burger King, across the street from the church. I'll never forget, it was a Burger King with uh, bulletproof glass in it. <laughs> you literally, does anybody remember that? You put your $5 in, it was like a bank. The turnstile will go around and take the $5, put your Whopper back in, and you get your Whopper. And <laughs> he sat me down and for three hours began to describe me to me. And by the gift of the Holy Spirit, by the gift of the word of knowledge, coupled with the discerning of spirits, he told me things that only I knew about myself. And it was like a Jesus at the well experience. And for three hours, I cried and cried and cried so much that I went through an entire canister of those Burger King napkins. <laughs> And I had at that point never heard about the gospel, never heard truly what Jesus had done for me, and I made a decision to get saved. Uh, my parents coming from that background thought, obviously, that I'd lost my mind, yeah. that I had joined a cult. Uh, you shared with me back yeah. in the room that you went through something similar, having a Middle Eastern background. Uh, this was a total betrayal to the family, a betrayal to the culture of the family. Uh, within eight months, they were getting baptized in the same church on the corner of my <laughs> Right 
So God is good. Powerful. Wonderful. This is the greatest miracle of all is to is to experience a relationship with God that you never had before, to be saved when you never believed before. You told me a little bit about a miraculous testimony of somebody from Liberia. Right. Tell us, draw the, draw the picture of what, what was going on in that situation and what happened. Sure. Let me just say this, that when I had gotten saved, immediately what the Lord put inside of me was a tremendous desire to see others get saved. To me, that just made sense. It, it, it didn't make sense to hang on to the greatest, the greatest gift and keep it just for myself. Right. And so from the time I was 16 years old, right immediately in my high schools, I began witnessing, began sharing my testimony uh, by the grace of God, winning whoever I could to the Lord. And when we planted our church in New York City a decade ago, we immediately began supporting missions works. And so we have several missions endeavors, and we're pretty comfortable with our missions endeavors, some in Ethiopia and Guatemala and Montenegro, and really weren't looking for any other outreaches. We had our hands full. And I was watching a secular documentary where they showed a former Liberian warlord. And I made contact with him, went to meet him in Liberia, and realized that this was probably the greatest salvation story since the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. And so this man was inducted into the Kron tribe, which is a very violent and pagan tribe in Liberia at age seven. He became the high priest of that tribe at age 11, with ritual child sacrifices being performed by him on a monthly basis. And so when the civil war in Liberia broke out, the leaders of the war would seek out such men who had a history of violence, who were taught to kill from a young age. And he became known as General Bud Naked. And so you might laugh at that, and it is a rather humorous name, but he used to fight naked. And he led, he led an army of six to 800 boys who would fight naked alongside him. Now, all of them had... Uh, had strange names like this because the names were intended to intimidate your opponents. So there was General Rambo, General Bin Laden, there was a General Mosquito, and because mosquitoes are scary because they, uh, they bring malaria, then they had General Mosquito Spray. This was the most vicious of them all. <laughs> you mean the, the Mosquito Spray was the most vicious? No. <laughs> <laughs> General Butt Naked. Okay. <laughs> That, that does sound intimidating. <laughs> it, I'm glad we can laugh about it today. Yeah. Because to have met him in the, in the late 80s and the late 90s would have meant your life. Uh, this was a man who really led a mass genocide in his nation. Wow. And would take children from their mothers and, and teach them how to use an AK-47. Wow. And I, I spoke to him about this personally. I said, how difficult is it to teach an 8-year-old? He said, it's very easy. I said, how did you accomplish this? Well, he would, play, he would play movies for them, Hollywood movies with maybe Sylvester Stallone or Jean-Claude Van Damme, where they die in one movie, then he would put another movie in where they were alive again and say, this is how it is. You'll just keep going. And he, he created this fantasy world for them, and they were willing to give their lives for him. Well, Christians in the town were praying, and when I say in the town, I'm talking about the capital of Monrovia in Liberia. They were praying for the salvation of these warlords that were pushing the civil war forward. And one day, right after he had performed a child sacrifice, he heard a sound behind him. And he said he turned around, and he saw the brightest white light he'd ever seen, and a man wearing white, bright linen. And he said he heard in his ancient Kron tongue, not modern Kron, but ancient Kron tongue, my son, why are you slaving? And he turned, and he used to be in communication with a deity, a demonic deity that he served. He said he'd never seen any kind of spirit being like this. And he said to the spirit being, I am like a king here. What do you mean I am slaving? And he said, you have well spoken that you should be a king, but you are only slaving. Repent 
and live or persist and perish. And the, vanish, the, the vision vanished. He went out into the battlefield and tried to use his gun, and the gun exploded in his hand. For the first time ever, he felt the sensation of fear in battle, and he retreated from the front. Turns out, the church I pastor is called City Light Church. The bishop that was praying for him is the bishop of City of Light Church in Monrovia, Liberia. And so when I had originally contacted him, he didn't really know if I was being sincere. He thought maybe that I was just making up the name of my church to get in with him. Because so many people contact him, not with grace or mercy, but wanting him to be punished. When he became a Christian, he actually went to the government of Liberia and confessed everything he'd ever done. He said, I am responsible directly for the death of no less than 20,000 people. It was uh, the Liberian, and let me just get this right, the Liberian Truth and Reconciliation Act. And he said, if you want to send me to prison, I will go to prison. If you want me to die for my crimes, I will die for my crimes. But if you want me to live, I will live. And he was the only warlord because of the power of his testimony, the fruit of his life, that they let go scot-free. And so I was just with him a few months ago. And to this day, I have not been with a gentler, more loving, more Christ-like man than Joshua Blahi, the former warlord of Liberia. There is something about you when you've experienced a depth of forgiveness. You know, Jesus yes. said, he who is forgiven much also loves much. What you're, what you're hearing right now. I want to ask you something about this because what you just said is so powerful. What you're hearing right now is a testimony of a man in Liberia who was a warlord who offered ch children up, child sacrifices to demon spirits, and he killed thousands of people, and he was rescued by Jesus Christ. You might be sitting there saying, how could God ever forgive me of my sins? How could God ever forgive me of the crimes I've committed, the the evil thoughts that I've had. If it wasn't for the grace of God, each of us would be just like that man. Killers, murderers, uh, deceiving and taking advantage of innocent children. If there's hope for that man, there's hope for you. Pastor, tell us, because there's so many people that are watching, they need hope, then their friends and family members and their loved ones need hope, and everyone knows somebody that feels like they're not worthy to be forgiven. You just said something powerfully. He who has been forgiven much, loves much. Tell us a little bit more about that. I, I enjoyed spending my time with Joshua Blahi because I wanted to firsthand touch and feel and look into the eyes of someone who has experienced such a depth of forgiveness. And when I first announced that I was going, even some people in my own church were a little troubled. How can we forgive someone who has essentially led a mass genocide? We're talking about 20,000 murders. And we so easily forget who the Apostle Paul was. <laughs> we, we think that he persecuted a few Christians and maybe put them out of the house. You know, in the scriptures, Paul says, I compelled Christians to blaspheme. Now, what did that look like? What did it look like when the Apostle Paul would go into a house and force Christians to renounce Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior under the penalty of death or stoning. And so when I looked into his eyes, we're talking about Joshua Blahi right now, to see somebody so at peace, so at peace with their maker, so at peace with himself, uh, the grace of God became so real to me. And I've preached for years that, that God not only loves you, but that he likes you also. That God is not mad at you that we are to forget, distinctly remember forgetting our past. But I met somebody who was living that. And I, I want to encourage people with all of my heart, you know, when we're going through something difficult or when we're under the guilt and shame and condemnation of sin, we always feel that our sin is the worst. The enemy loves to come and make us feel very alone in our sin. And he goes to work on causing us to self-deprecate and self-reject because we feel surely there's nobody on planet earth who can be as wicked as i and it's simply not true 
when you can see Jesus forgive and cleanse somebody like a former warlord, and not just forgive, but restore to the point where he is ministering to tens of thousands of people in West Africa in mass crusades. His book will be getting published by Destiny Image uh, in February of 2013. And he, he, we actually helped him start a boys' home with 18 boys uh, in Monrovia, Liberia. We went to West Point, the worst ghetto on planet Earth, where when you come in, you openly see 30, 40 young men injecting heroin into themselves right there. We went there, got 18 men who had qualified, brought him back to this house where he is now teaching them a viable trade, getting them off of drugs, and discipling them. And they're all ex-combatants of the Liberian Civil War. There's, you know, Pastor, there's really, there's really no one so broken that God can't There really is. No one's so lost that God can't save. Right. You said something earlier. You didn't, you didn't find God. He wasn't lost. He found you. You were lost. This man you speak of who was a mass murderer, we think of people like that in terms of Hitler and Stalin and, and people that, uh, that committed the most heinous crimes. Yet we judge other people who have done even the smallest thing in comparison. And God wants people to know and hear, no matter how big or how small your sin is, Jesus Christ died for it. Jesus Christ paid the price for it. You not only can be forgiven from it, you can be completely set free. Pastor, there's so many watching right now that may feel condemned. They may feel like God could never forgive me. Like you said, uh, I feel like I hate myself. I reject myself. How could God ever forgive me? He's mad at me. Pray for them because there are some that are ready to be saved right now, ready to be snatched out of the jaws of condemnation, sin, and hell itself. Would you pray and lead the people to the Lord who are watching right now? It will be my pleasure. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray specifically for people who are under the burden of shame and guilt and condemnation. People who have swallowed the lie when the enemy has told them, you can never be forgiven again. You have sinned one too many times. People who have swallowed the lie, you have fallen from grace. I pray that the reality of God's love through Jesus would come into your heart. That you would realize that your sin is not stronger than the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. <laughs> that a righteous man falls down seven times, but each time gets back up again. Father, let there be a release of your anointing yes. and your grace. Restore bandage together people who have fallen lord let prodigals come home i just speak yes. out to people right now that when you come back home the father will run out to meet you yes. he will fall on your neck he will kiss you he will put white robes of righteousness on you and sandals for your feet and he will throw a party for you and kill the fatted calf your dad loves you and misses you, and no sin is too great to keep you from him, thanks to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.